This is the uh, sixth week, six weeks, sixth Sunday in this six-week series called uh, Zoom Out and uh, the story of the Bible. The idea of the series, which we're concluding, is that it's very important when we read the Bible, and by the way, the Bible's a hard book to read and it's sometimes hard to understand. When we read the Bible, if we want to read it correctly, then we need to, when we're reading a scripture, we need to figure out where in the story of God that scripture comes from. It makes a big difference whether it's from Genesis or Revelation or from Isaiah or Ephesians. It makes a big difference. So as you're reading the verse, you gotta go, where does this verse connect? What's the context of this verse? And we've been using a diagram uh, for all six weeks, and the diagram uh, uh, shows that we divided the story up into six chapters that help us with the Bible. And this story of six chapters is the most epic and important story in the world. And this is the big story. And so chapter one, five weeks ago, creation. In the beginning, God created the fall. When Eve and Adam chose to disobey God, the chosen people, when God looked down and chose the Israelites to be his people. And then there was Jesus. In the fifth chapter, Ed talked about last week, the church, and today... Uh, I talk about the final chapter, which is a new heaven and a new earth, a new creation. And this last chapter is fully arrived at when Jesus returns. But there's a part of it that's happening right now among us. Jesus said, let thy kingdom come. And then there's also a part of it that's happening when someone dies and is transported to heaven. But the full chapter comes when Jesus returns and redeems everything. And so uh, today, um, uh, uh, I want to help us uh, in a couple ways. One, I want to help you figure out how your little personal story fits into this grand epic story. And um, sometimes I see that people are living their lives in their workplaces and their neighborhoods without the full story. In fact, for me, I lived my life with only three chapters of this story for a whole long time. You see, when I was at camp, The camp counselor who was leading me to give my heart to Jesus, he said, you do it based on three words, sin, salvation, service. And so uh, I didn't become a Christian at camp. I didn't give my heart to Jesus, all that I knew of myself, to all that I knew of Jesus at camp, because I felt it was a little too manipulative there at camp. But I was uh, in the top bunk in in my dark bedroom about a week later, and I kept thinking, sin, salvation, service, sin, salvation, service. I prayed my first prayer. Dear God, if you're real, there was a lot of faith. If you're real, would you help me know it? And if sin is true, and I feel like it probably is in me, and if Jesus died on a cross for me, would you forgive my sin? And if this all works out, I'll serve you. And so, uh, (laughs) I mean, I didn't say I had a huge faith. But that was my first real prayer in that bunk. And so then, if you look at the story, I only had the fall, and then I had Jesus, and then um, I had the church. And just think what I missed for so long. I missed creation. And you go, well, how does that affect a life? Well, if the first thought you have about yourself is broken, that's a problem. The first thought you ought to have about yourself is creation, which is, I was created first in the image of God. There's something really special about human beings, and I'm a human being. And God made us in his image, and there's goodness in us. I never knew that. I thought the only inner core of me was sin. And it's not true. I'll be redeemed. There's good in us. We have that possibility. So um, it it affects us. So uh, missing creation actually uh, caused me to miss some of the image of God. And uh, one more thing about the story before I jump into a new heaven and a new earth. I want to um, talk about the fact that uh, if you want to know more about this story, in fact, a lot more, Sally Baker is starting up a, a study called Square One, which she wrote, and the details are on our website and at our uh, Welcome Center. And if you want more about the story, check out Sally Square One. Now, today... Uh, My job uh, I've accepted is to do two things. One, I want to inspire you with heaven. With heaven. I I want to inspire you with heaven. I want you to uh, actually get one little bit more eager to get there. And I want you to think new thoughts about heaven because as I've reflected on heaven, I think we've made it far too spiritual, like too foggy, too angel-based. And um, if you actually read the Bible... 
it's far more concrete. It's far more earth-like. I mean, there are streets. There are cities. There are houses with many rooms. It's far more concrete than we've tended to think about it. And um, uh, so that, that's my goal. And uh, as I thought about giving this teaching, I thought uh, there are three groups of people in the room. And the first group is the biggest, and that's what makes this teaching so challenging, because the first biggest group in this room right now, most of you are in it, are you're disinterested in this topic. And you're disinterested because it seems like a long ways away. You have kids to raise. You have uh, bills to pay. You have vacations to plan. You have friends to make. You have ball games to watch. You have a job to do. Some of you have a graduation coming or a wedding coming. And this all seems so far away. So you're almost disinterested. And so group number one, what I'd like to do is say, listen closely today. Because one day, this will really matter. Group number two, some of you are in this group. You have a loved one in heaven and probably went there recently and you're kind of interested. It's like, oh my goodness, what is so-and-so, my dad, my brother, what are they experiencing? This is where my family is. Um, with our family tragedy a couple, eight, 20 months ago, one day Aaron, my daughter-in-law, asked me to help her find a great book describing and explaining heaven because where she had gotten was, I want to know what Ben, Charlie, and Bailey might be experiencing. What does the Bible say about heaven? And some of you are there. Some of you have a loved one there and you're saying, what does the Bible say about heaven? And then uh, in our church family, people get there every week. And uh, uh, you'll... Many of you will note that tomorrow, right in this room at 2 p.m., we have a memorial service for John Cruz, who went to heaven far sooner than he ever expected. Um, the third group are those of you who are older and you're intensely interested because you might be sick or you're realizing it's closer than you ever thought it would be. Uh, and you would love to have a peek into uh, this new home that you're going to have. And my mom was in this group until two weeks ago. In fact, I thought my mom would be listening to this sermon and getting encouragement for heaven. Well, then two weeks ago, she went to heaven. And uh, she was uh, at bed at Pinnacle Specialty Care and with my dad sitting by her side. And she went to sleep and she breathed her last breath and she was gone. And so now, rather than listening to this talk, which I thought she'd be doing, uh, she could tell me a whole bunch about heaven. She was ready for it. So as I teach today, this is a very personal to me, and it's personal to many of you. I've been uh, walking with the John Cruz family this week, and uh, they uh, hurt, and they have loss and grief, but not as those without faith. Right? That's what the Bible says. Not as those without hope. Uh, before I uh, begin this, pull back the curtain, peek into heaven. Uh, it's important for you to realize a couple things. One, God did not give us a lot of data on heaven. I'm going to put up eight things that I think he told us about heaven. And, but there's not a lot. And I've wondered, why didn't God tell us more? And I don't know, maybe we couldn't handle it. Maybe uh, there's some other reason. But we don't have a lot of data on what actually heaven is like. But we do have some key scriptures. And so in this teaching, I'm actually going to do something we would very seldom do in a church service. I'm going to tell you what the Bible says. And then I'm going to end that. And then I'm going to tell you what I think. <laughs> okay, so first let's start with the Bible. Um, uh, Revelation 21, 1 to 5. We have it on the slide. Then I saw, this is the Apostle John in the book of Revelation. He's seeing a dream. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look! 
God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eye. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything, everything new. And then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. I couldn't help but think about that song. These words are trustworthy and true. His promises are yes and amen. And then I want to bring one more verse. Uh, It's from the New Testament, Ephesians 3.30. Now to him, God, who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. So what does this verse say? This verse actually encourages us to imagine. Now to God, who is able to do immeasurably more than we can imagine. Go ahead, imagine. Go ahead, imagine. Imagine life to the full. Imagine heaven. Imagine a new heaven and a new earth. Imagine the coming of Jesus. Imagine. And according to his power, he is able to do more. So one of the things I think we should do today is imagine heaven and then hear God whisper, but it's better than that. It's better than that. It's better than anything you can imagine. It's better. Uh, Okay, so what did the scriptures say? Number one, there will be a new heaven and a new earth that will be eternal, will last forever. And if you want to see a little bit what this might be like, you might look at the Garden of Eden. And you might say, hey, the Garden of Eden was a perfect place before sin. And God made it uh, close to heaven. And so if you want to know, hey, what might heaven be like? Look at the garden. And it was a real place, and it had trees, and it had animals, and it had streams and water. It was the perfect place for Adam and Eve until the fall. So there's some hints of what heaven would be like right there in the garden. Number two, God will be with his people. He will walk with us more closely and more intimately and we will be in his presence in a more concrete way. Maybe again like the Garden of Eden. Remember the Bible says that God would come in the evening and walk with Adam and Eve. His presence would be real. And it wasn't like later when um, he said to Moses and Abraham, you know, don't come into the presence of God. It wasn't like that. Before that, Adam and Eve were absolutely in the presence of God. Number three, there will be no death, no mourning, no crying, no pain. I can't picture a place like that. It's so hard to picture a place where there's no sadness. No tears from sorrow. There might be tears from laughter. There might be tears from joy. But no tears from sorrow or crying or pain. Number four, the new heaven and the new earth will be amazing beyond our wildest dreams. Um, You think about uh, heaven, and again, I'm I'm on this thing. It's not as spiritual as we think it is. Uh, The prophet Isaiah writes this in Isaiah 11. He's like describing this new heaven and new earth. Isaiah 11, 6, the wolf will live with the lamb. I've never known how to answer the question when my grandkids would come up to me, and they're in here. My grandkids would come up to me and go, Grandpa, are there animals in heaven, dogs and cats? Now, my son Ben would say, if you want a dog or a cat, there will be one. A little of a wimp out of an answer. (laughs) Now, I do want to say that here it is in Isaiah, there will be animals. I mean, it says, the wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling will all be together. And a little child will lead them around. The cow will feed with the bear. Their young will lie down together. A cow and a bear together, growing up. The lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the hole of the cobra. And the young child will put his hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on my holy mountain. God's presence will be as the waters over the sea, everywhere. A uh, new heaven and a new earth will be amazing. Number five, everything will be made right. 
Everything will be righteous. Uh, I don't know how, but justice and grace and love and goodwill will prevail every corner of heaven. There will be this new world and there will be no abuse, no greed, no rape, no selfishness, no murder, no death of any kind, no regrets, no guilt, no poor self-esteem or self-hatred. Whatever your issue deep inside you right now, whatever your struggle, it will be gone in the presence of God. It will be gone. Number six, we will have new resurrected bodies. Uh, uh, again, this is hard. Uh, they may be similar to the body of Jesus after his resurrection. The disciples recognized Jesus most times, and he still had a record of his scars. Remember, he had his, his holes in his hands and his feet, but they weren't a problem. He uh, walked through walls, to be with the disciples? I mean, I'm kind of excited about this resurrection body. I'd like to walk through walls. Um, I would like for this old body to be at its very best. Um, uh, again, this has become important to me, this new body thing, because I've seen too many bodies in caskets. And uh, Charlie, Bailey, and Ben's body was mangled in the crash. And what's their heavenly body going to be like in heaven? And uh, my mom's body just wore out. Her blood didn't work, her heart didn't work, her lungs didn't work, it just wore out. And I can imagine how thrilled they are to get new bodies that are still recognizable and still part of who they are. I can imagine that. And then God whispers, but it's better than that, Dave. Um, we can only see part of this dimly now. 1 Corinthians 13, 12. You can see now as in a mirror dimly. But one day, we will see clearly. C.S. Lewis, in his writings, calls this place right here what we can see shadow lands. And we can only see a little bit now, but we can see shadows of heaven now. Have you ever been out with a sunrise when the sun's just coming up and you go, oh, such beauty. That's a shadow of heaven. Have you ever felt complete acceptance by somebody? Like without judgment or anything, they just come up and a lot of times it comes from a little kid who is just so glad to see you and they run up and they just throw their arms around you and go, oh, I love you so much. That feeling is a shadow of heaven. Right? So um, we can only see dimly now. Number eight, God will do more than we can ask or imagine. Ephesians 3.20. Dream your best dream of God's new heaven and new earth, a place where you are welcomed and affirmed by Jesus and greeted by people who love you deeply, a place where you are both comfortably at home and at the exact same time, you are on an adrenaline-filled adventure. Can you imagine that? You're as comfortable as your favorite spot at home, and you're as thrilled as an adrenaline-filled uh, adventure you've ever been all at once. A place where you're continually learning amazing new things while receiving deep, unconditional love and companionship of God and your loved ones. A place where you have important things that really matter to do. In heaven, you have important work to do. You know, work was not a part of the curse. Work was a part of the garden. God, before the curse, before the sin, before the fall, God said to Adam and Eve, I've got important work for you to do. You're going to name the animals and you're going to care for my creation. And heaven's going to have important work for us to do. So some of you who have not been eager for heaven because you like to work, well, there's going to be work there. It's a place where your body works better than ever, and it actually performs uh, better, and uh, you don't get tired, afraid, or hurt. And a place where colors are brighter, love is deeper, opportunity is amazing, and we worship God in every way, in our work, in our words, in our deeds, in our songs, and in our dancing. There will be dancing in heaven. <laughs> a place with no regrets or anger or grief. So dream your best dream of heaven. 
dream your best dream, and God whispers, it's better than that. Now, there are uh, three concepts that uh, I want to deal with that have always been troubling to me about heaven. And so uh, the first concept is the concept the Bible talks about crowns. And it says, when we get to heaven, we're going to get crowns according to the good work we did. And I've never liked that concept. Uh, one, I don't like crowns. They never fit on my head right. Um, they're always too big and hard, and I don't like crowns. So why would I have to have a crown? I mean, and then it says you sit, you, you take the crown with its jewels, and you sit it at the feet of Jesus. I never got that part. And then I was reading one of many, many books uh, from theologians about heaven, and one guy had this idea. He said, obviously, the concept of crowns is biblical. And he said, but what if instead of a crown, it was like a merit badge or a thank you note? And when you get to heaven, people like crazy are standing in line, and they have thank you notes for you. And uh, Jesus gives you a bag, and someone says, thank you for that gift you gave me as a neighbor. Thank you for the clean water we got in my village because you donated to so-and-so. Thank you that I actually am here because of some of the work you did or the ushering you did or the parking you did at Orchard Hill Church. And pretty soon, you get this huge bag of thank you notes. And you're in heaven and you realize, I don't deserve this. The King Jesus, he deserves these thank yous. And then you take that bag of thank you notes and you walk over to the foot of Jesus and you're just weeping. And you put the bag there and you say, these are for you. These are for you. It was in your power and your might and the gift of my life. These are for you. And if you actually play that out and you think of that person you know in heaven and you think of the thank you notes they got and then they get to take that bag and put it at the feet of Jesus. Now that kind of a crown I can get excited about. And so um, I would just uh, suggest that's possible. There are crowns of some kind. Uh, number two, the concept of time. This is kind of troubling. When you step out of this earth into heaven, there is no more time. We sing a hymn, a traditional hymn that says, when I've been there 10,000 years, I've no less days to sing his praise. So I've been there 10,000 years. I've no less days to sing his praise. It's outside of time. Heaven is outside of time. It's like it has to be because it's eternal. There is no time, which actually, if you play that out and think about it deeply, there's no before and after. Oh, gosh, this is mind-blowing. This is mind-blowing to get outside of time. When we step into the eternity of heaven, the time dimension totally changes in ways that we are not able to understand right now. But I think it's like we're stepping out of a sequential world uh, into a different kind of a world with different kinds of dimensions. And there is, uh, everything is present for God and everything is present for us, which would mean that our loved ones probably do not wait for us in heaven. Because once you step outside of a time, there is no wait. So it's almost like I get to heaven, and I'm there, and I turn around, and there's my wife, who came later. Oh, and there's my children, who came later in their world, but not in my world. And there's my grandchildren. So I think about Ben, Charlie, and Bailey. Are they waiting for me to get to heaven so they can hug me? Or are they outside of time, and it's going to be their present reality, and there is no wait. I was telling my dad this. He goes, Dave, this is too far out there. <laughs> this is not understandable. And I, I agree, it's not understandable. Now, but play it out. Play this out. Some of you have lost children. Aaron's lost two. What if a part of being in heaven is you get to raise those kids? Outside of time, God can do a lot of things. And what if you could imagine finishing raising those kids in heaven? What if when Aaron gets there one day, 
Jesus puts his, puts his arm around her and says, I've got some important work for you to do. You get to raise these kids. And some of you have had deaths way early. And what if a part of heaven, as Jesus puts his arm around you, he says, you never even got to meet this little one. But here they are. I'm just saying, dream your best dream. And God says, it's better than that. It's better than that. Uh, the last one is the concept of learning and growing. You know, the Bible says when we're in heaven, we're going to get the mind of Christ. We're going to be like pretty smart. <laughs> For some of you, that's going to be a promise, you know. <laughs> yes and amen. <laughs> but um, here's the deal. What if you don't get it all at once in an instant? I always thought I walked to heaven and then somehow I have the mind of Christ. What if I get to like be in a learning mode and I'm always learning and I'm always learning? What if it's that? And some of you love to learn. What if it's like that? Okay. Now, I'm going to tell you a part of my dream, my imagination for Dave Bartlett. And um, I only do this to free you up to imagine. So what if it's like this? Uh, one day when I arrive at this new heaven and new earth, this heaven, and some theologians think it's an intermediate heaven because uh, it's a lot like heaven, the ultimate heaven, but new heaven, new earth comes when Jesus comes back. So maybe there's an intermediate kind of a heaven, which still has all the qualities of the garden and all that. What if one day when I arrive, the first person to welcome me in this new world is Jesus? That's pretty biblical. With a smile on his face, he looks into my eyes and he says, Dave, my friend, welcome into your new home. I'm so glad you're here. My father has built a place just for you with many rooms. It's beautiful. I can't wait to show you your place. Oh, by the way, well done good and faithful servant. There are some people waiting to see you. And then up walks Ben, Charlie, Bailey, my grandparents, my mom, my dad, John Cruz. And they all say, welcome to your new home. Smiles on their faces, enthusiasm in their eyes. Ben, Charlie, and Bailey, and my parents welcome me. Charlie says, Grandpa, you have so much. I have so much to teach you. You're behind. Bailey climbs on my back, which was the number one thing we were doing before her death. She says, Grandpa, I want to ride on your back for a while, just like I used to. And I can carry her all day long and not get tired. Wait, wait. We've got to go to one of the rooms prepared just for you. It's the room of crowns. And when I enter it, there are a ton of people who have been helped. And they have thank you notes. And then I do get to lay them at the feet of Jesus. Before I know it, Linda's there. And about the time we're done with our greeting, our children are there because we're outside of time. And our grandchildren, and there is a reunion. And it's like a reunion only better than anything we could have imagined. And then Charlie says, Grandpa, I want to show you my favorite waterfall and some animals, let's run. And with Bailey on my back and my family at my side, we just run across meadows and meadows headed for a waterfall, and we never get tired. We run and run and run, and we don't get tired, and then Charlie says, let's climb this waterfall. Isn't it beautiful? And we start climbing on slippery rocks, and then we're up at the top on a slippery rock, and he says, Grandpa, try to be afraid. He says, lean out over this rock and just try to be afraid. And you can't be afraid. And in that moment of adrenaline-filled adventure, I feel more at home than almost anywhere I've ever been. Go ahead and imagine the greatest heaven you can imagine. And God told us in the scriptures, I believe, he will whisper, it's better than that. 
last night in the prayer room. I met with John Cruz's family, uh, four or five kids, his wife right now. We talked for a long time about the service and about John. We laughed and we cried. And uh, we realized together, living in this broken world hurts. It hurts. And there's loss. But we do not grieve like those without hope. And of all the weeks to teach this, there's not a better week than Holy Week because the evidence is in the empty tomb of Jesus who says in John, I go to prepare a place for you. If it were not so, I would have told you. Yes, and amen. I'll pray. Dear God, we can get too used to the idea of who you are and what heaven is, and we lose our awe of who you are and what Jesus did and what heaven will be like. Father, my prayer is that we would be a little more inspired about this home you've built for us in heaven. And my prayer is that we would think a new thought about this heaven that Jesus talked about for us. And Father, I... Uh, ask that uh, if there's anyone in the room who has like questions about heaven or questions about their own uh, journey with Christ, that this is a perfect week to get an answer. Father, help people all week long in lots of places give all that they know of themselves to all that they know of Jesus and trust in him as best they can so that one day, we would be there in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen.